Good afternoon, good evening, and early good morning. It really depends on where you are. So here we're coming back to the ICG public lecture series. Cassidy, could you please share my slide? Thank you. All right, ICG is the Institute for Corporate Governance. It is at Cali School of Business, Indiana University. The Institute was founded in 2004, and the goal has been the same. We want to conduct and facilitate uh, the dissemination of high quality research. We like to inform policymakers about the direction of corporate governance. And uh, we have hosted a whole series of public lectures on corporate governance, starting from the traditional uh, topics like corporate board, uh, CEO compensation, CEO market, to the more uh, new challenges that corporate governance or corporate boards are facing, such as data and technology, climate risk, corporate culture, cybersecurity, and so on. So the whole series has been co-hosted by the ECGI, uh, that's the European Corporate Governance Institute, and I use All Strong Workshop. And we usually, I usually give special thanks to Marco and Elaine from the ECGI today. Marco is here with us. I still want to thank uh, Scott, my colleague from uh, Indiana University, for his effort to help us co-host this whole series. So for this academic year, we have three lectures left. The first one is today, uh, is Climate Risk and Institutional Investors. I was chatting with Laura and Marco before the lecture. Uh, this is going to be a very vivid lecture because I've received several emails from my IEO colleagues express, expressing their opinions from different sides, starting from uh, de-investment to climate hoax. So I know people have different perspectives. I think today we have this opportunity to exchange our perspectives, try to listen to the other side to understand the problems more systematically and hopefully more scientifically. So we cannot have a better speaker than today's distinguished uh, speaker, Professor Laura Starks from UT Austin. So that's today's lecture. And uh, for next month, we have Professor Kelly from UBC. She's going to talk about corporate culture and directors' directions for the future. And the last but not least, in May, we have a marketing professor discussing sustainability from consumers' perspective. So Professor Nira um, Pahara from Georgetown University is going to be the speaker. So now I'm going to do a little bit of marketing. This is the QR code for our April lecture, uh, Corporate Culture and Directions for the Future. I'm going to pause here for 20, 25 seconds, take out your device and you can scan the QR code. So now I'm going to introduce our distinguished moderator for today. I don't usually use distinguished. Uh, our moderator today is Professor Marco Bett. He is the Goldschmidt Chair Professor for Corporate Governance and Stewardship at Solvay Brussels School, Brussels School of Economics and Management at ULB. Thank you, Marco, for making my life easier without pronouncing the French name of your university. Um, Marco's main areas of expertise are corporate in corporate control and institutional shareholder activism. And his latest research, uh, it cannot be uh, better fitting, is on the ESG engagement and fossil fuel divestment. My last direct um, uh, observation of fossil fuel divestment was my daughter's graduation from Harvard University in 2019. The entire graduating class wear signs, uh, put up logos uh, asking for fossil fuel divestment. But again, I know the audience may have different views. Uh, let's start the debate and start the discussion today. Um, importantly, Marco is also a founder member, a fellow, and executive director of ECGI. Uh, that is International Interdisciplinary Scientific Research Network. It has very wide coverage and deep reach to scholars as well as practitioners and policy makers. Thank you, Marco, for being here for moderating today's uh, guest speaker, uh, Professor Laura Stark's speech. Uh, the podium is yours. <laughs> 
Thank you very much, Ian. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Laura. Laura does not really need any introduction. So you've got her title, the George Cosmetz Centennial Distinguished University Chair and Professor of Finance at the McComb School in Texas. And she also won the 2021 Moscovich Prize uh, for Research in Sustainable Finance, which is turning out to be probably the world's most prestigious prize uh, on this subject. And you can type her name into Google Scholar and you can find many more things. Now, Laura is also, um, you know, she gave the uh, presidential address at the AFA just, you know, in January, just so very recently. And I commend uh, Marcus Brunemeyer's very complete introduction uh, of her there. Um, I will not repeat everything that Marcus said, and I couldn't possibly imitate his Bavarian accent as somebody born in Hessen, uh, but I do recommend the introduction and also Laura's lecture. Now, you might ask, why are we here again listening to Laura? And there are two reasons. One is that Laura has many more things to say because the research that she's produced is just uh, enormous and incredibly rich and very international. And secondly, because when we woke up this morning, uh, and I'm using the word woke really as uh, a verb, uh, when we woke up this morning uh, in Europe for breakfast, this was the headline that we saw. And it is really quite uh, perplexing uh, what is going on in the United States. And people here are really trying to figure it out, even when they know something about the subject. Now, why that is that important? Well, one reason is uh, you can see the background that was prepared for me uh, here because uh, yeah, climate knows no boundaries. Uh, it affects us all throughout the planet. But also, there's this picture, which shows you the 100 largest pension funds in the world. And it is a, it's just a reminder that, yes, the Japanese government pension funds is the largest, and Norges Bank is the second, the, the Norwegian public pension fund global is the second largest. But look at all those blue funds on the right. That's the US pension funds. And they really bring a lot of the equity capital that's being invested around the world to companies. And it really matters how they're regulated. Are they going to be able to choose freely how they want to invest? Or are they going to be painted in different blue? Or are they going to be painted in red? And I don't mean the Canadian red that you see at the bottom of the screen. So we couldn't have chosen, or Yun, you couldn't have chosen a better date to invite Laura uh, to give her lecture. And I'm very much looking forward to what Laura has to say, and then to your questions. Uh, and I'll try to my best to keep the discussion um, interesting uh, and civilized. So Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marco and June. I'm very, I'm very pleased to, to be here um, to talk about climate risk and investors. And um, <clears throat> I think we should start with the, the fact that there exists increasing carbon in the atmosphere. And it's been particularly increasing um, uh, since 1950. Uh, and, and what we can see from, from this chart is you can see how carbon was had had a lot of volatility, but it did not start going up quite so high until 1950. And, and the expectation is that it's gonna go up any, even higher unless something gets done. And when, when there is more uh, atmospheric carbon, then we get increasing temperatures. Um, and this is, this is a graph from Professor Ed Hawkins showing global temperatures um, and how much the blue was when they were cooler in the, the late 1800s, and then how much they have increased uh, more recently. And so because of this, there have developed a lot of climate risks for both companies and investors, and institutional investors are increasingly concerned about the climate risk. So let's talk about the climate risk and what are the challenges and issues with climate risk for investors. And, and the first one is, and I think this is appropriate since this is a, a corporate governance uh, seminar. Um, the first one is that climate risk, some people think of it just as being an environmental risk. No, it's also a social risk and a governance risk, both for the companies, but also for the investors. And what we still need to understand for given investors 
is how much of the concerns about climate risk are come from a, a financial value perspective, and then how much of it is non-pecuniary that is based on the investor's tastes and preferences from a values perspective. So, so I think about um, ESG as having a value per financial value perspective, which is very different from the investors that come to it from a values perspective. And so uh, along with uh, my colleagues, uh, Philip Kruger and uh, Zach Sautner, we did a survey of 439 large institutional investors across the world and asked them about their motivations uh, for incorporating climate risk into their investment decisions. And this chart shows the results. They, they, they could choose more than one, so um, they could choose up to three. So these are not mutually exclusive, but these were the top motivations they gave for incorporating climate risk. And if you look, um, three of these come from financial value. Some believe it's beneficial to consider this for investment returns. Um, they also believe that, that incorporating this in investment decisions can reduce overall portfolio risk and that it can reduce tail risk. So these, so these come from financial value. There are also some that come from values. There are those that, that believe it's important because it's a moral ethical obligation and those that believe it reflects their asset owner's preferences. And then there are two additional ones that, that I would call a blend of the value and values that it protects the reputation because um, that could have both aspects of value and values and that it's a legal obligation of fiduciary duty. So in terms of other challenges and risk, climate risk is difficult to price and hedge because it's systematic there's a lack of sufficient disclosure by portfolio firms, and it's difficult in finding um, suitable hedging instruments. And so I'm going to talk about each of these later in the talk. Um, it's a first order topic for policymakers. Um, so that in and of itself increases the regulatory risk component and requires consideration of its time varying nature. And then we think about climate risk in terms of its negative effects on asset values, but it can also provide return opportunities for a number of different companies. So just a, a few more things, uh, basics on climate risk for, in for investors. There are different types of risk. Physical risk can be chronic or it can be acute. Chronic, an example, would be sea level rise, which we're, we're seeing increasingly. Um, acute, it is from hurricanes and other kinds of natural disasters. And then there's the transitional types of risk in terms of policies, in terms of regulatory risk, the liability for companies, and then technological risks. And then, and then another risk that I like to think about in terms of climate risk is reputational risk, because that becomes very important for companies. Um, the, the risk is both systematic and um, company specific. One major problem is we don't know the time horizon. And so it's very difficult. And that also leads us into, we not only have risk, it, we have a lot of uncertainty where we can't even measure the risk. So we asked the uh, investors to rate the importance of climate risk from one to five. And, uh, and we broke up the transition risk into regulatory risk and technological risk. And those both ranked a little higher than the physical risk, but they thought that all three were important risk. Also, further evidence shows that analyst investors are increasingly concerned. So, um, uh, Sautner, Van Lent, Vilkoff, and Zhang have, a, have a, a paper on looking at conference calls. So these were earnings conference calls. And, and, and I think what, one thing that's important about this is they took only the question and answer uh, part of the call. They didn't take what the, the part of the call where the company decides you know, what they wanna promote, but the questions and answers to find out well, how much has climate change increase in terms of the, the what's being asked of the of the um, CEOs and CFOs and, and other executives. And so so this graph shows from 30 sorry from 80,000 annual observations from more than 10,000 unique firms in 34 countries between 2002 and 2019, you can see how the references to climate risk have been steadily climbing over time. 
And they also looked at just regulatory risk um, and also found a similar increase uh, in, in, this, in these references to this over time during the earnings conference calls. There's a, another paper by Ilhan Sautner and Vilkoff where they were concerned about climate policy uncertainty and they provide evidence that investors are pricing climate policy uncertainty. And, and they, they, they considered that the regulatory climate risk is likely most severe for firms with large carbon emissions. And these regular tr regulatory changes have jump-like effects on asset prices. And so they looked at the Paris Agreement and they looked at um, out of the money put options and found that um, the carbon emissions were positively associated with tail risk and that they, they, there was repricing around the Paris Agreement. Um, the, another question is what happens with corporate bonds? And so with um, uh, Lee Seltzer and Chief A. Zhu, uh, two PhD students at the time from the, the University of Texas that are now at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and um, NTU in Singapore, we looked at whether climate regulatory risk affects corporate bond risk and pricing. And our hypothesis was that climate risk would be borne uh, by, by the, the, the issuers and investors for corporate bonds and particularly to the risk of regulatory enforcement. And we also use the Paris Agreement as a natural experiment to see what happened. Now you might say, well, why are you using corporate bonds? But for corporations raising funds in financial markets, the bond market rather than the equity market is the marginal source of finance. And also for most firms, climate and environmental risk are fundamentally downside risk. Uh, further, in the cross-section, downside risk has been shown to be the strongest pr predictor of future bond returns. So we would expect if the, their, the Paris Agreement was a shock to the corporate bond market that we should see effects uh, from these bonds. Uh, so, so this is a difference in difference test, and we use several different treatments. Here I've shown the top high emission industries, but we also, we also used um, the companies, uh, we, used, we used the ESG score, the E score, um, and, and looking at, looking at the, the, the difference in difference where times zero is the Paris Agreement, the blue dotted line is the uh, parameter estimate each month um, for, the, for the relationship between credit ratings um, and, and for these industries. And so then what you can see is we find no, no pre-trend and we find a significant drop um, after the Paris Agreement. And then it, then it kind of flattens out. We found a similar result for the yields, although they came back down uh, more quickly. Uh, uh, but but we do we also find this increase in the yields around the Paris Agreement. So both credit rating analysts and bond investors reacted to the uh, the Paris Agreement and 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 the expected regulatory risk around this agreement being signed. We also find we found stronger effects for the bond the bond issuers who had more operations in states in the US that had um, uh, stronger enforcement of EPA rules. Okay, so the other thing we looked at was, well, if, if, if there was a shock, did you find that certain types of institutions sold or bought around the Paris Agreement? Um, and so we looked at, for high emission industries, we also looked at below median firm environmental scores. And we found that for all institutions, they tended, uh, you know, on average, there was a decrease in, uh, in their ownership of the, of the bonds in high emission industries. We found this um, also significant for insurance companies. And if we look at the environmental scores and how they were affected, we find that the institutional, excuse me, the insurance uh, firms were selling these bonds and the mutual funds were buying the bonds. Um, so we did find this shift in, in ownership uh, 
uh, over time, although overall there was some decrease in total institutional bond ownership from, from um, mutual funds and insurance firms. So the implications of our study are that corporate bond investors and the rating agencies respond to climate regulatory risk. And this is consistent with the survey views I showed you a few minutes ago, that institutional investors think regulatory risk is an important channel through which climate risk impacts investors. So what about physical risk? We've, I've been talking about regulatory risk. Well, we can look at sea level rise and, and think about the potential consequences. The South China Morning Post had a headline in November, 2015, that rising sea levels were set to displace 45 million people in Hong Kong, Hong Kong Shanghai, and uh, uh, Tianjin. And, um, uh, if the earth warms four degrees from climate change, then if we also, if we look at the uh, this annual mean sea level rise in Victoria Harbor. Uh, so this shows the sea level rise from 1954 to 2022. And you can see that there's been this definite trend over time uh, uh, in, in the sea level rise. So what, what do we know about what this is doing to financial markets? Well, we have a number of studies that have found that sea level rise is affecting real estate prices, uh, sales volume, and the descriptions in the real estate listings. There is some evidence that disputes the sea level rise is affecting real estate prices, but, but I would argue we need even more evidence about this because most of these studies have looked at Florida. Um, uh, although the, the, the real estate listings, the Jiglio the et al. Is, um, looks also at uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, and New Jersey. There's also evidence that sea level rise is affecting municipal bond markets and other evidence that physical risk in, in terms of, of heat stress is also affecting municipal bond markets. There, there are so many studies um, showing that climate risk can impact equity markets. Uh, and, and in fact, Peter Tufano has a new paper where he, that's a survey paper and there's over 500 papers um, uh, that, that, that are about climate finance. So, so this is really a, a growing field. Um, and, and, and since we, there's also evidence that markets may not be able to co correctly value climate risk, it's an, it's an important field for people to be looking into. Another thing that we ask in our survey is the, what approaches the institutional investors took in terms of um, uh, looking at the, at the risk management of climate risk in the investment process. And we found, and again, they could, they could give us more than one of these, but we found that the largest percentage analyzed the carbon footprint of their portfolio firms and analyzed stranded asset risk. Uh, we also found that uh, Many of them reduced the carbon footprint of their portfolio firms once they once they had analyzed it, and that many of them reduced the stranded asset risk. So we asked them about stranded asset risk and the perceptions. And what we found is that that for a number of industries, there was a perception that stranded asset risk was already very high in the industry. This survey was in 2018, but coal producers was the highest, followed by the unconventional oil producers and then the conventional oil producers and, and so forth. We also in the survey then found that, that general portfolio diversification and ESG and integration were both considered ways to, to manage the risk uh, of climate change in, in the investment process. And there are those that were 25% said they were hedging against climate risk. Now, what we know about the hedging of climate risk is that it's very difficult. Um, there, there, is, there is a study that, that looks at um, catastrophic bonds and finds that it's, it, it doesn't work very well in terms of 
hedging of the climate risk. There are also synthetic approaches that have been that have been uh, using equity markets that several uh, teams have have brought forth. And then finally, I guess I can't not talk about divestment today. And um, so 20%, which was the lowest percentage, said uh, divestment was, was the approach that they used to manage climate risk. So notice there, there are lots of other ways in which it's being managed. Divestment was the least for the group of institutional investors that we spoke to. Um, and, and, and there have been a number, and you can see again, these are recent studies. There have been a number of recent studies that have discussed the effectiveness of exclusion or divestment. And, and um, they've talked about that, that most managerial compensation contracts won't be affected by divestment, that the, the effect on cost of capital will be too low to make a difference, that the effectiveness depends on the motivations of a majority of the shareholders. Um, if shareholders want to change a company's actions, tilting with engagement is better than divestment. And then Marco has a very interesting new work where they're arguing about, look, the divestment movements provide social pressure for change. Um, so, so even if we find all of this ineffectiveness um, in terms of the financial uh, effects, that there, there can also be um, social change effects. The empirical evidence um, found that there was little discernible effect on firm values from South African divestments, that exclusion can be costly to pension plans and endowments, that it can be effective under certain conditions, including having um, environmental and socially conscious institutional investors. The, uh, another uh, paper found that institutional portfolios are being decarbonized because of portfolio reweighting rather than through shareholder engagement, which I think is, is, is an important thing um, to understand about what the institutional investors are doing. We also ask the investors um, about engagement and how they engage on climate risk. And, and we found that they invest, they engage in a number of different ways, such as holding discussions with management, proposing specific actions to management, voting against management on proposals that are related to climate risk, submitting shareholder proposals on climate risk, and then questioning management on a conference call about climate risk. So, so, so institutional investors are engaging on climate risk. Uh, and then the question is, well, what kind of evidence do we have about that engagement? And uh, one paper has found that institutional investor engagement increases firms being willing to voluntarily provide climate risk disclosure. Another paper, which looks at this from a different, uh, the engagement was on a different um, topic found that the institutional investor engagement reduces downside risk from climate change. And um, this is consistent with previous evidence that institutional investor engagement has results. Uh, we looked at the number of different engagement uh, techniques that were, were used by the investors. And we found that most of them use more than one. And um, uh, the, 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 the low number that didn't have any um, engagement was similar to, to an earlier survey that I'd done um, with uh, Joe McCarrahy and, and Zach Sautner, where we asked about governance engagements. And so, so the governance engagements, uh, the number was very of different techniques was very similar in terms of uh, for the climate risk engagements. Uh, well, and then uh, we also were looking at well, where do you think the mispricing would be would be the the highest? And you can you can see that it is um, it is up uh, the oil, automotive, electric utilities. Um, and part of that is due to disclosure. Again, we, we asked them about, well, well, what about the investment opportunities? And these were the top 15 responses to that question. Uh, and, and the font is larger for the ones that are more frequently named. And so renewable energy uh, was not surprisingly the, the opportunity that these investors saw as being the most. But then water technology, electric cars, batteries, infrastructure, were also important ones that they, they found. And they found that 
that that um, um, oil was was one as well. Okay, so I would like to talk about disclosure because disclosure is very important in financial markets. In fact, the efficiency of financial markets relies on timely and accurate information regarding firms' risk exposures, and given the increasingly important risk exposure related to climate change, investors need high quality information on the firm's climate risk exposures um, in order to make informed investment decisions and for, for um, these risks and opportunities to be correctly priced in the markets. Um, and also sound disclosure on climate risk is essential for regulatory efforts to protect financial stability, which is one reason that you see a lot of central banks are focusing on climate risk. So we, we ask um, uh, the investors as well about what they thought about climate risk disclosure. So Emir Ilhan, Philip Kruger, Zach Sautner, and I um, have, have a paper on investors in climate risk disclosure. And this, we asked them specifically, how important do you think it, it, climate risk disclosure is compared to reporting on financial information. And what we found is that 79% believe climate risk disclosure to be at least as important as financial disclosure. So it's, it's um, uh, and, and again, this was in 2018, it would probably be a higher percentage today. Now, what we also found was that investors who thought it was more important had larger assets under management, they had a higher ESG share of their portfolio, and they believed climate risk to be more financially material. So, so the ones who thought it was more important, this was very intuitive. And, and, and I should say this was um, an anonymous sur filled, a survey that was filled out anonymously, but we asked them questions such as, what are your assets under management? Uh, what share of your portfolio is invested in ESG stocks? And, um, and you know the other questions like, do you believe climate risk to be more financially material? So we could so we could have some cross validation of the answers to some of our questions. Okay, so so uh, Christensen, Hale, and Luz have have suggested two possible uh, reasons for mandatory climate risk disclosure. Uh, to these two goals, and and they 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 we're talking about corporate social responsibility, but it, but it applies equally to, um, to climate risk disclosure. And the first goal is the disclosures just to give the investors the information they want on the firm's climate effects, what, what these effects are having on the firms. And so it's, it's basically single materiality. How does climate change affect the firm? The second goal is um, that actually, uh, somebody wants to drive change in the firm's climate finance behavior through the disclosure regime. So it's basically double materiality. Not only how does climate change affect the firm, but how do the firm's actions affect society and the environment? And so, so again, we can go back, I think, to this values, to the value versus values, because the first one is much more centered on financial value. And the second one is more centered on values. And I, I think this may be one of the reasons for the debates that are going on today about ESG in general is this, this difference in, in what investors want and differences in how uh, regulatory agencies are thinking, are thinking about this and governments are thinking about this. We also ask um, whether they engaged or plan to engage portfolio companies to report according to the recommendations of the task force on, on climate related financial disclosures. And we found that 59% said they did plan to engage the, or were already engaging the portfolio companies on giving better disclosure. And again, we did some cross uh, validation and we found that the investors who engage were those that had a higher ESG share of their portfolio, those that believe climate risk to be more financially material, and those that are located in countries with higher social norms about the environment. Um, and, and lots of research has shown that European countries have higher social norms about the environment than other countries uh, around the world. 
we asked them if they plan to report the carbon footprint of their portfolios and 60% said yes, 24% uh, said no, and then but 16% said they do not know. And uh, again, those who report were the larger institutional investors, those that had a higher ESG share of their portfolio, and those that believed climate risk to be more financially material. Uh, in terms of the mispricing, again, we, we found that the investors' opinions on the quality of the current climate reporting are related to the perceived underpricing of climate risk. So those that think there, there's not enough information, they also see more mispricing in the current equity valuations. And this is consistent with um, Michael Bloomberg, who was chair of the TCFD, and he said, increasing transparency makes markets more efficient and economies more stable and resilient. So we had several hypotheses about how institutional investors would react to disclosures about climate risk. Um, so our, the baseline uh, hypothesis was that climate conscious institutional ownership would be positively related to climate risk disclosure. And, and so we're gonna do an empirical study of this where we're, I'm gonna define for you in just a, a minute or two, who, the, who we define as a climate conscious institutional ownership. So, so we did this using holdings data rather than using our survey data. And if you think about the costs and benefits of climate related disclosure, you can think about, well, the effect will be weakened if the proprietary cost of the disclosure are higher. So, so consider the role of competition. If you're in a more competitive uh, market as a firm, then, then your, the institutional investors may not demand as much disclosure from you because of the proprietary cost. If you are a larger firm, then the information production costs are gonna be relatively lower. Uh, and so we would expect that the institutional investors would, would have uh, more demand for climate related disclosure for larger firms. And then um, uh, if, if you think about the externality benefits from the disclosure, we would assume the effect would be strengthened if those benefits are higher. And so we consider the role of carbon emissions. And this is the, um, uh, the analysis that we did where we have, we have three different uh, dependent variables listed, listed up on top, the scope one disclosure, the climate risk disclosure, and then, um, then taking, taking the log, just a different uh, specification of this climate risk disclosure. The climate risk disclosure is using um, uh, CDP questions, and it's, it's looking at um, the quality then, how much is, how much is being disclosed. Um, and this, this, this measure was also used in, uh, in, in Flammer et al. Uh, paper on um, shareholder activism and climate risk disclosure. So our three measures of climate conscious institutional ownership are those, those institutional investors that are located in countries that have a stewardship code. So we're looking at institutional ownership from the investors that are in countries with a stewardship code. Um, another one is if you're in, in a country that has high um, environmental norms. Um, so we look at the percentage ownership for, uh, for the, the high, env in high environmental norms. And then the third one is if they're a universal owner. And a universal owner, uh, by definition, is an institutional investor that, that really owns, you know, kind of a share of most companies around the world. Um, and, and so they're, 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 we, we look at the number of companies they have and how well diversified they are in order to define the universal owner. Um, and so, so we, would, we define these three types of institutional investors as being climate conscious investors. And, uh, and we look at then at the relationship of the disclosure and the quality of the disclosure to ownership, institutional ownership by these three types. And then we, we have a number of controls for different firm characteristics. We have industry and year fixed effects. We have country fixed effects. And 
what we find is a strong relationship between the, the amount of disclosure uh, and, and, and whether um, of, of firm disclosures between, between the ownership and, and the disclosure. And we find this no matter how we, uh, how we define the disclosure, the quality of the disclosure, we find, we find this strong relationship. Um, so, so, you know, the demand for climate risk reporting should depend on the costs and benefits of the disclosure, as I described before. Um, and we find strong evidence that the disclosure demand is affected by climate specific costs and benefits. So we find that the effect of this climate conscious ownership, which I just showed you is a positive effect on the climate related disclosure. We find it's moderated among firms with high proprietary disclosure costs. In other words, the institutional investors uh, sense that it's gonna cost them more to have, to have more disclosure. Um, it, it's magnified among large firms with lower information production cost, and it's magnified among firms in the highly carbon polluting industries. So, so then a question was, okay, are these influence effects or, or selection effects, which, which are really driving our results? And the, um, the, the, relationships that we find can exist for two non-mutually exclusive reasons. One is an influence effect. The climate conscious institutions may actively engage firms to demand that they voluntarily produce such information. A second one is the selection effect that climate conscious institutions could have a propensity to invest in firms that provide better disclosures. Um, and so, so we examine the imposition of French Article 173 to better understand the influence effect. So French Article 173 demanded not that the firms disclose their climate risk, but they but it demanded that the um, institutional investors disclose their their climate risk. And so when we look at um, uh, we again we do a difference in difference analysis and we look at the 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 disclosure of scope one uh, both overall um, and then and then after the the this new law in France and whether there was high French institutional ownership or whether there was just French institutional ownership uh, and we find that even controlling for the high French institutional ownership or the French institutional ownership, that there's a strong relationship that after the passage of this law in 2016, that there was more disclosure uh, by the firms and um, the, the quality of the disclosure was better as well. And we did this across all firms. We looked at non-French firms. We looked at, at a balanced panel. Uh, and we looked at um, at only the case where French um, institutional ownership was greater than three percent. And again, in all cases, we found a strong relationship. So we would argue that the influence effect has an important um, effect on climate risk disclosure. Firms are more likely to disclose uh, because of the ownership of their institutional investors. So in conclusion, um, according to the institutional investors, climate risk are important investment risk. They have important financial implications for portfolio firms. They have started to materialize and are being priced, especially those risks that are related to regulation and those risks that are related to sea level rise. Um, institutional investors value and demand climate related disclosures. Their disclosure demand is affected by climate specific disclosure costs and benefits. And the influence effects can help explain the equilibrium relationships between institutional investor ownership and disclosure. And that is it. Laura, thank you very much. Um, so maybe we just start by um, me reading uh, some of the questions that we got in the meantime on the Q and A. Um, so the first question goes right to the beginning of your talk. And the question is, financial values can come from a belief that climate is changing or from a view that politics will force 
certain regulatory changes. Uh, and then, you know, the question is, did your survey develop this? Because this came after your first slides. I think in your conclusion, you also talked about this more broadly. So if I understand the question correctly, the sea level rise, that's a real thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas then there's the uh, regulatory, uh, which is probably speaks to stranded asset risk, but that's obviously not the only regulatory risk uh, that's out there. So, um, you know, what's, what, you know, what, yeah, what's your answer? Okay, so so my answer is I, I think that we, we're trying to get both. So, so we ask, and, and I guess I, I, I would have had time after all to, to show some of, the, some of the other results, but we asked, we asked the institutional investors what they thought the temperature would be at the end of the century. And we found that four in 10 of those investors thought it would be more than three degrees increase. Um, and so that, that's, there's the belief that climate is changing. Um, <clears throat> And we also ask them for, for time horizons on the regulatory risk and the physical risk. And we found that, the, that they, they believe the regulatory risk is, um, is, is, is already uh, coming about and the physical risk would be, would be coming soon. Um, so I, I, think we, I think we got, we, I'm sure, you know, after you do a survey, you always figure out, oh, I should have asked this question differently. But, uh, but we, we did try to get at the differences. Okay, so the questions uh, keep uh, they keep uh, coming in now. So, but I'll go with uh, Paolo Camara. Hi, Paolo. Uh, so, Paolo asks, how do you assess institutional investor pressure for global scale harmonized climate risk disclosure and management standards? So, I I think you partly answered that, but you know, I'll read it to you again. How do you assess institutional investor pressure for global scale harmonized climate risk disclosure? And management standards. So I think that relates. Oh, oh yes. Okay. To your so, French yeah, I, I think the institutional investors are are really pushing on the um, the the standards boards. There are so many different standards organizations, and and just um, February twenty first, it was announced uh, in the newspaper that the um, International Sustainability Standards Board has agreed on a, a list of harmonized rules that are, that are going into effect next January. And a lot of big corporations are already using um, either the, the GRI um, um, rules or the um, European sustainability rules on, on how to disclose. And so, so the ISSB is trying to get, to get, to get all of these to be, to be more harmonized. So I think we will be seeing that very soon. Yeah, so, I, so Paolo, I think the answer is that we are quite optimistic about the global standard being adopted and, you know, certainly investor demand, but I guess also demand from companies has to do with it because they don't want to file 15 different kind of things. So yes. I think, you know, once you realize that there is going to be disclosure on this, you want one standard. So actually, you know, global harmonization on this is, is is being welcomed by everybody. I mean, that's at least the feeling I get. Um, so, but then let me ask you, digress slightly, Laura. So you're, you're quite optimistic about, you know, the SEC um, proposal uh, going forward because the, the worry, of course, was that the US would not participate in, in a global standard, but you are quite optimistic about this. Uh, no. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not optimistic okay. that the current that the current version will go forward, right. um, and and if it does, I think there will be lawsuits. So, but what I'm optimistic about is the fact that so many corporations, whether the whether the SEC comes out with this or not, a lot of corporations are going to to follow the IASSB because they want to. Um, and, and those that don't are going to get pressure from institutional investors worldwide to do it. Now, let me ask you this question, and I know this is going to sound wild, but, you know, it seems to be a pretty wild world out there. So do you think that there might be uh, attempts to prohibit uh, US, U.S. corporations to follow international standards? Could you imagine such a scenario? Uh, I could imagine it, but... I would be surprised if it happened. <laughs>
Okay. Uh, we are on the record, so you know. Let's uh, <laughs> optimi Let's be optimistic. So that's well, uh, let, let me let me yeah, let me sorry. let me. I can imagine it happening. I would be surprised if it were effective. I mean, that's a better way of. Okay. <laughs> now you sound like now like you know like you sound like my wife was a lawyer. So, <laughs> so. Okay, so the next question comes from Geraldo Afonso Ferreira. So he asks, in your opinions, in your opinion, what is the level of stewardship of all these investors, uh, specifically the asset owners? For me, it all seems their fiduciary duties are very way below the minimum required. So I'll read the question again. Uh, in your opinion, what is the level of stewardship of these investors, uh, specifically the asset owners? For me, it seems the fiduciary duties are very way below the minimum required. Um, so I'm not exactly sure how to interpret that in what way, um, you know, how to interpret the uh, fiduciary duties and whether it's about value or values so you know you interpret the question laura uh yeah I, I i find that hard i think that you know fiduciary duties are being debated uh and and i think that they vary across different jurisdictions so you know what do we use as the as the benchmark for whether the fiduciary duties are are, are below or not? Um, I, I think it's uh, it 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 depends on on where they are, where they're located, um, and it it also depends on for the asset owners. It depends on uh, in part on on what their participants expect. So so um, there there are studies that that have Rob Bauer has some work where where they do um, done an experiment with pension fund participants in uh, the Netherlands and and has found that they are willing to give up returns for um, uh, you know social responsibility reasons and so again I think it just depends on on where they are. So I think it's actually a very important question and the question is of course about asset owners it's not about asset managers which is actually a good question, because in some sense, that's where the instructions should come from. So uh, if you are a faith based organization, I guess, then, you know, we can say, well, look, these are your values. Um, and then value will come from what your values are, that should be your driver. But if you're not necessarily a values um, pension fund, but you know, you have a mandate to get you know, returns for your uh, beneficiaries who are retirees, and you actually don't know what their political views are. Um, you know, if you're a trustee of such a pension fund today, um, what should be your guiding principle? Uh, I mean, if I heard you, if I heard the evidence that you presented, I mean, one thing that people don't take into account that there's not just returns, but there's also risk. So um, if you uh, ignore the risk that you presented so convincingly that markets are now pricing in and that we got the disclosure about, you know, even if you don't have values as a trustee, if you ignore that risk, you're really not doing your job or is there something that I don't understand? No, I completely agree with you that, 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 that you know, financial risk and, and a lot of Market participants believe that climate risk has financial materiality. And so then it is your fiduciary duty to pay attention to that risk. So, and the next question you don't have to answer, Laura. <laughs> okay. So, but, you know, you being from Texas and everybody, you know, being perplexed about Texas, especially from Europe. Um, yeah, if you are the chief investment officer of the Texas pension fund, any of the pension funds in Texas, uh, and you are responsible for this question. You are to invest your portfolio, you know, taking into account the risks that are out there in the world. Uh, can you really ignore climate risk, you know, doing your job properly? 
I do I do not believe so. I think you 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 know if the markets are pricing climate risk as you said, then then you cannot ignore something that the market is pricing. It's it is financially material. Right. Okay. I think that was a very clear answer to this question, and you know we are on the record. Uh, okay. So the next question comes from Spain. This is from uh, Jorge Pérez uh, Seijo, uh, and he says, hello from Spain. Given that the implementation phase of the Paris Agreement was somewhat, over, or so, somewhat overlapped with the effects of the Brexit referendum in June 2016, did you find any significant difference between data from the UK carbon emission companies and the rest of the world? So we can't escape Brexit even on this particular call. <laughs> so we're all an expert on this, I guess. So Laura, you can answer the question or you can say, you know, like um, in the podcast recently when Bernie Sanders was on a UK podcast being asked about his opinion on Brexit, he said, I'm not really an expert on, you know, UK politics, which I thought was a very diplomatic answer <laughs> you know, from him. So Laura, over to you. Well, there could be spillover effects, uh, but we we so so this I assume is talking about the the test looking at the Paris Agreement effects on the bond right. market. Uh, we only used U.S. companies for that because that's what we that's what we had the data on. Um, but we did start early uh, in terms of 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 stopping the test period in order to, to you know, avoid any other events that may have been affecting it. So I guess, Jorge, the answer is, uh, maybe this is an idea for another paper. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, so I think we answered that one. I think we answered that one. So um, the next one comes, and you know, there's no voting for questions. So I'm just taking them uh, in sequence. So first come, first answered. So the next one is from Kenneth Koo. Uh, is there an obvious way to disentangle the pecuniary preferences, i.e. value preference of investors, as opposed to their deontological preferences, i.e. preferences which stem from values? I ask this because similar conduct from fund managers can stem from both. So I'll read the question again. Um, is there an obvious way to disentangle the pecuniary preferences or value preferences or market value preferences of investors as opposed to their deontological preferences, i.e. preferences which stem from values? I ask this because, or he asks this, uh, because similar conduct from fund managers can stem from both. Uh, very good question, Laura. I, that is a very good question, and um, I don't... I, I don't know of a way to disentangle that. I think it's I, I think it's a great idea for research. I would love for somebody to figure it out, but I haven't figured that out. Okay. So I mean, I suppose you could look at at what um, you know. You could take some ESG funds versus non ESG funds, but but the problem is ESG funds have so many different motivations. Um, you know, not just climate or so maybe take some climate ESG funds against against non ESG funds. I'm not sure because 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 the, the individual portfolio managers could have their own values motivation that we can't see. Well, or you could take some funds that are clearly values driven. Yeah. You know, that would be another uh, option. So anonymous attendee, okay, so do we do anonymous? No, we don't do anonymous, sorry. So we have uh, the next one then comes from Chi Yong Liu. So actually, what, actually, I can answer the, the I answered the, the anonymous one. <laughs> oh, you want to answer the anonymous I want, one? Yeah, because it, because Okay, let's answer the anonymous one, okay? So, you know, would your identification be sharper? Oh, I see, okay, what well, you want to answer. Would your identification <laughs> be sharper if using non-French firm disclosure on the LHS uh, and French owners on the on the left hand side and French owners on the right hand side. So that's a tech geeky question. Okay, go for it. <laughs> and 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 one of our specifications did exactly that. Okay. And, and we found <laughs> okay. we found the same uh, qualitative results. <laughs> right. Good. 
Okay, so I de dealt with that one. Um, so Chi Yong Hyu, uh, so what possible characteristics of institutional investors which lead to your result and conclusion of your research? So what possible characteristics of institutional investors which lead to your results and conclusion of your research? Um, I... Uh, difficult to... We yeah, would now, if this was... You know, in a room, we would ask, can you please repeat yeah. the question? But, you know, we can't. So I'm afraid we, we yeah. don't understand the question. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, okay, so here comes Vikas. Okay, so Vikas and Marotra. So hi, Vikas. So are institutional investors willing to trade off returns for lower emissions? And if so, is there a way to calibrate this return carbon elasticity? Okay, so that's... Uh, so I think this gets back to the values versus value because those that are that are that are the value investors would not be willing to trade off returns for lower emissions. Um, so I again maybe this is a way to back out who are, who are the values investors versus the value investor. Um, Okay, let me follow. Let me follow up on this because I asked. Uh, I taught two classes this this week uh, on Tuesday evening responsible capitalism and master students, and uh, this morning I taught uh, corporate governance and stewardship, and I showed them the same fact, which was BP's CEO uh, rowing back on their uh, net zero commitment in February and I showed them the event uh, study type evidence. So the day he announced that they are not, that they're actually not going to go as fast or that they're going to stay in fossil fuels for longer, I asked the, the students, what do you expect happened to the share price? You know, I mean, abnormal return, what, what do you think happened? And the responsible capitalism people thought that it would go down. <laughs> Um, no, they actually thought it would go up. Okay, they thought it would go up. So that's the responsible capitalism class that completely failed there. And then this morning, they thought it would actually go down. So it did go up by 10%. So what was your reaction to that fact? And what's your interpretation of that result? Um, I think that it shows that there are more value investors in the market than values investor in the market because, um, you, know, well, you know, we're gonna be using oil and gas for a long time. And uh, uh, my understanding is that the, the renewable resources now are adding to to the oil and gas resources because, or the fossil fuel resources, because overall worldwide, we need more energy. And so until we can, we can get better alternative energy or carbon capture and storage works, there's still money for BP to make um, from selling the oil and gas. I, I also asked them, do you think that the uh, investment in BP has become more risky. Mm. Uh, and there they actually pretty broadly agreed on the answer. Uh, they thought it'd become more risky. And you know, the, the answer that was given was, you know, if the management can flip flop in this way, uh, they could also flip flop the other way around. Oh, um, yes. Yes. So they thought that actually BP had just become riskier. And I thought that was a really excellent answer. And I was quite pleased with myself. For, you know, for yeah, that's a, that's a good and, and, you know, I, I guess that goes back to the disclosure, the transparency of, of, of what companies are doing and how they view the risk. Um, yeah, so, so Vikas, thank you for the uh, you know, it's obviously very important, uh, but it also shows that I think we live in a very uh, uncertain world if you, uh, if you are a value investor, because, you know, things can change very quickly. And, yes. you know, if you think that BP can actually dig up, dig all its reserves out of the ground, um, you know, it could, you know, if there's a change in government, it could, it could change actually very, very quickly. So, you know. 
Um, Jim Whittington, okay, I find the relation between universal ownership and climate disclosure quality slightly counterintuitive. The big universal owners are typically passive and don't invest on the basis of company fundamentals. Are passive owners pushing for disclosures they don't themselves use? Uh, wouldn't it be more compelling if companies with better climate risk disclosures were attracting active investors who invest on the basis of those things. Okay, so, I mean, I read this as um, Jim, and we can't ask him, Jim Whittington, uh, assuming that none of these universal owners are decarbonizing uh, their portfolios. Uh, so, let me split the question into two. So, is he right that actually universal owners don't really have an incentive to push for more um, disclosure? And then secondly, uh, what, what is your view on uh, decarbonizing? And should the major, uh, if you're a trustee of one of the major um, pension funds I showed at the beginning, you know, uh, you can name anyone you like, should they really, given all the net zero commitments that we now have, um, should they really be decarbonizing their portfolios with a view to 2030 and 2040? So, um, so the first one is, is I think much easier because, um, <laughs> because the, the, the universal owners do want to know what's going on with their portfolios. Some, some of them are actually providing carbon footprints for their portfolios. Um, and, and they need to understand the risk, even, even if they're, they're, uh, index owners, um, understanding the risk is important. Um, so your second question well, on the second one, let me reformulate then, you know, do, do you think they have enough information at the moment to allow them to come to a risk assessment to decide one way or the other, whether they should decarbonize or not? No. Do they need more information? Or can they I, just look at the list of countries that have made uh, net zero commitments? I I think that the um, I think it depends on their on their preferences uh, because because it, as you in fact have pointed out in your new paper um, the 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 finance and economics research shows that that investors shouldn't divest, that engagement is, is a better way to go. And, um, uh, but as you pointed out, the divestment movement itself can create social pressures to get companies to change. So, so I think it depends if, if the universal owner, uh, institutional investor is a value investor, then they shouldn't divest. If there are values, they should use engagement because they have a lot of power. If it's a values investor, then they have to decide what their values are. And, and I believe people should be able to, to invest according to their values <laughs> if they want to. So um, first of all, I'm extremely grateful that you mentioned a paper, which we are about to put out as an ECJ working paper. So you've given it a plug before we've put it out, which is extremely nice. Okay, now um, in the paper, we do make a very careful distinction between the word divestment, which we say is values driven, and the word uh, net decarbonization, uh, which we argue in the paper is a value risk proposition. Mm. Um, so that's, I think, in terms of language, we will have to start being more careful when we talk about divestment, because my reading is that divestment is a values-driven proposition. Mm -hmm. So my take on your first chart, for example, is that if you could do your survey over time, you would find more institutions being faith-based divesting at the beginning around the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. And we show that in a chart, the timing of it. Whereas today, more people are decarbonizing their portfolio, not because of any values, but because they see precisely the risks that you pointed out in your lecture. And they understand that at least some countries in the world and you know for example europe are going to go through 
with their net zero commitments. And if they don't, you know, they are just too exposed to, to high um, uh, greenhouse gas emitters if they don't do something about adjusting their portfolios. So that, that's, the point, that's the point we're actually trying to make in the paper. So I was a bit fishing, you know, for you <laughs> <laughs> supporting that thesis, you know, from the asset manager point of view, from the asset owner point of view, that, you know, if you believe the commitments that countries have made, you should actually be starting to keep decarbonize, otherwise you're not doing your job. But, you know, anyway, so the, but you know, Jim, I think we can have another seminar. <laughs> okay, we have two more minutes. We're gonna have two more, two more minutes. Okay, 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 yeah. So the next, the next question is very easy from um, Samir uh, Trabelzi. He said, excellent presentation. Well done, Nora. I should have read that one Thank last. <laughs> um, so I think we can have, uh, we, you know, we can have one more uh, question. Uh, so Vic gives us two more, but you know, oh, here's Kylie. Okay, so we'll give Kylie the the last uh, question. So because she's going to speak next, right? You know? yeah. <laughs> That's <Okay>. true. <laughs> so Kylie gets the next question. Yes. Uh, so apologies to Esther and uh, Julian. Uh, well, let so me let me just say that Esther and I were uh, PhD students together, so it's great. To, to see her, and I think her question's too hard. So yes. Okay. I'm glad, okay. But... So Yun, can I get one more minute? Okay. Yes, so yes, we can ask please. Esther's question too. Yes, okay. So yes. Esther, uh, how much do you think today's Senate vote will affect? I was I was going to get you out of that one, Nora. But... No, 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 no. I don't want to answer that one. I think we only have time for Kai's. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we only have time for Kylie's. Okay. So you'll answer Esther separately. Okay. Right. So. Kylie, regarding values versus value, how, how about people who are in charge of asset allocation by their gender and by their personal characteristics, such as from countries with high social norm regarding uh, egalitarianism show effects on their portfolio choices? How about people who are in charge of asset allocation, but their gender and their personal characteristics, such as financial? So I think you know, Kai is asking about uh, culture. Yes. Um, because that's what she's really, uh, you know, yes. what she's going to talk about next. That's right. So that's, that's right. a segue and for you, Yun. Cultural um, norms are very important, um, uh, and 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 we show and we show some evidence that the that the cultural norms matter for the values. Do they also matter for the value on the risk? Uh, it, you know, that's an interesting question. I, I, I think that perhaps cultural norms could make, could make um, the investor more aware to pay more attention to the environmental risk. So, I, I would think it would be it would matter for the for the value investors as well, just in terms of paying attention to that type of risk. Yeah. So, you know, I, and actually that actually could explain a lot of the heterogeneity as well, because obviously yeah. different institutions and different people have different, different tolerance for risk. So, yeah. you know, that could also explain quite a lot. Okay, Yun, I think, uh, you know, Laura, we could talk for an hour, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> okay, but Yun, uh, you, you'll have more seminars coming up. So, you know, first of all, thank you, Laura, and thank you, Yun, for giving me the opportunity to moderate. And I turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Marco. You did a fantastic job as yes. a moderator. So you now raised the standard very high. Thank you, Laura, for this wonderful speech. I attended your AFA speech, but I still learned a lot more today, uh, especially about the climate risk disclosure. It seems that we have a lot more to discuss. So maybe in the next season, we could have more discussions. Um, coming up, <laughs> Kylie had a good starter for her own speech uh, on April 6th. We have this corporate culture and directions for the future. The new moderator, <laughs> it, it used to be me. I was a placeholder. Will be Ankit Kalda, uh, my Kelly colleagues. Uh, Ankit will moderate uh, Kelly's speech. And the last uh, speech for this year is sustainability from consumers' perspective. This is a marketing uh, perspective. Presenter is Professor Nuru uh, Paharia from Georgetown University, and the moderator is my uh, Kelly marketing colleague, a Mansour Kamotov. Uh, All right, so uh, the last slide, I'm going to show the QR code for Kelly's speech as well. I'm putting up together the schedule for the coming academic year, which is 2023 fall through 2024. 
2024 spring. Uh, I have uh, Steve Kaplan and Dirk Genter on my agenda for CEO markets uh, because we have a private CEO market and public CEO market. I think that will be an interesting fireside uh, chat format. And I have uh, uh, Nadia Malenko on voting. So those are going to be exciting uh, topics. And if you want to volunteer to uh, give a public lecture on corporate governance related uh, issues, or if you know someone who has a, a great um, uh, coverage and knowledge about a very specific uh, uh, topic, please feel free to send me uh, an email. This is icg at indiana.edu. Again, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Marco. I'll see you next month. Okay. Thank you, Joan. Thank, thank you. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.